Greetings fellow Laysarans, Rodamon here. Thank you for tuning in to the first episode of a new Let's Play tutorial series covering Laysara Summit Kingdom. If you would like to skip the game's overview, please use YouTube chapters, and additional details can be found in the description of this video. Lysara Summit Kingdom is a town builder game where you plan and design intricate towns in the high peaks of the Himalayas. The lowland below the mountain has become cursed with thick fog, causing mass famine. So you're tasked with carefully managing resources and protecting your town from avalanches and inclement weather while you ascend to the summit of the mountain peaks and build your kingdom. This series will be a mix of let's play and tutorial. I will be starting off with the tutorial mission and then be jumping into one of the other maps. So let's get started. So these are the maps that exist so far, uh, but as you can see, there will be a campaign and there's free build and also challenges as well. So there will be even more in the roadmap as development progresses. But Hope Spark Hill is the tutorial. Of all the years in the long and storied history of the Kingdom of Lesara, this one surely has to be the worst. Following the harvest, a mysterious mist suddenly appeared all across the kingdom. Then, the pandemonium started. Crops started to fail. Disoriented animals barely produced any milk. People started to get sick. And you can't see anything. The fog in this valley is even worse than the city. For all we know, we could be lost already. Faith, my friend, have faith. We're following the path that's been chosen for us. Path? I don't see any path. Just the same damn forest going on for days. It's not entirely the same. Look, there are more and more pines, and the thickets are thinning out. We are getting higher. We'll get to the upland shortly. Even if that's true, what will we find there? Mark my words, mountains are no place for humans. Yes, but they are a place of the spirits. We will settle at the foot of the mountain and make our way up to build a grand altar at the very summit. The spirits surely will recognize our efforts and help us to drive the mist away. And Lysara will be saved. Yeah, that's great and all, but did you see how low on supplies we are? Never mind building a temple, we'll die of hunger before even reaching the top. Come on, it won't be that bad. Look on the bright side. Mountains are above the mist, so we'll be able to cultivate crops and pasture our yaks again. Mm, maybe. Until the first avalanche sweeps us all away. Stop worrying about minor details. We're on the most sacred quest, and nothing will stop us. Onwards! Finally, a place above the mist, and with enough space to establish a small colony. It'll serve as an outpost when we move on to bigger mountains. I guess it makes sense. We need to maintain contact with the capital in case they need to come and save us. Nonsense. We'll achieve great things in these mountains and this small settlement will be our first step. Let's start by building a district for our workers. Camera controls. The default bindings are WASD and right mouse button hold to control the camera movement. The scroll wheel to zoom in and out and then holding the mouse wheel for the overview camera, which zooms all the way out. Time controls, spacebar and one, two, three. First, let's place a food market. It'll be a central point of your settlement 
as it distributes food amongst citizens living nearby. And I'm going to turn, or attempt to turn the game down mm, a little bit more. So, um, in the UI, because the tutorial doesn't really cover it all that well, uh, I am going to pause the tutorial here. Top left is your current objective. You have your revenue and treasury. So right now I'm earning 400, which is from the assistance from the capital, and my treasury is full. Uh, you have three types of citizens, lowlanders, which would be blue, the artisans in red, and the monks in yellow or orange, and then of course yaks. Yaks aren't, well, they're kind of citizens. And then this is the research level, which we'll get into later. Down below, you have the different types of buildings that you can make. Residential buildings, food, prosperity, enlightenment, distribution, avalanche protection, treasury, resources, roads, bridges, and shafts, as well as duplicating, moving, and demolishing. The hotkeys for duplication would be shift, for moving it would be left control, and for demolishing it is F as in foxtrot. So, let's go ahead and build the food mart. Oh, one other thing. Uh, in the top right, you have the global power of avalanches. Uh, once we get into avalanche mitigation, I will get into that. But right now, the avalanches on this tutorial mountain are weak. And in fact, there aren't snow packs to even cause avalanches. Brandon, thank you for the raid and welcome to the stream. Welcome, welcome. How's it going today? Let me get you a, let me get you a little bit of a shout out. You were playing... Oh, I don't even know what that is. Ayudin Chronicle 100 Heroes? Cool. 100 Heroes? Um, Tell me a little bit about it. Oh, it's a JRPG? Sweet. Well, I'm going to get back to this tutorial, but uh, I'm, I'll be reading chat to see what you say about it. So the first thing we want to do is to build a food market, and I'm going to build it well where the tutorial tells me to. See the marker above the food market? It means the building does not have a road connection to the mountain entry point, which would be this here. Let's fix that by building some roads. Build a road between the food market and the mountain entry point. And it will be a simple dirt road. Done. Every settlement needs workers. Building houses increases the town's population, so let's place a few of them near the food market. Have 32 lowlanders living within a range of the food market. So this is a lowlander hut, and it has space for four lowlanders. When they upgrade, uh, they do house more people, but I won't be able to upgrade them for a bit. The other thing to note, is if we click on the food market, you can see the section of the highlighted road. This is the range that it has. So building houses beyond this highlighted range will not have access to food. You can increase the range of a food market by paving better roads, but they cost more. So a dirt road is free, no upkeep, and it costs two um, treasury gold per tile. Whereas the tamped roads and the paved roads have an upkeep cost. So it's very important to know that you don't want to drive up your upkeep costs by having nicely paved roads everywhere. It becomes unbelievably expensive very quickly. So those are eight houses. And you can see the population reflected here. So... Eight workers are working in the food market to make sure the food market is running. And then the rest of the uh, 32 workers, which is the remainder of 24, are unemployed. The very first settlers on the mountain. That's great. We should take care of their basic needs, like shrines. They need to have spots where they can pray for the success of our mission. 
Uh, I meant providing them with food. Well, I guess we could do that too. Uh, but spirituality comes first. What a pushy monk. Okay. Uh, building with ranges. Citizens look to cherish their spirituality like spots like the praying place. So provide 32 lowlanders with access to their praying place. So if we hit the enlightenment tab, we have a praying place. It costs 20 to build and an upkeep of four. And also, if you click on any of the houses, you can see what it costs to upgrade the houses. So the way to interpret this is that the praying place provides enlightenment. And see how the praying place is like wide, two units wide? It will fill up two of these upgrade progress squares. And then um, Samsa, which is a type of um, grain, would fill up two and eggs would fill up two. So that's how to interpret that. So if we put a praying place here, it covers all of the houses we've built. But if I put it over here, as you can see, the range is limited. So we want to build as few of these as possible to reduce our upkeep so that we can um, remain in the black in the treasury. So I'm going to plop it here. Done. Great. You have just fulfilled a need of your citizens. So here, as you can see, the two... Oh, well, let's... Uh, let me go back. Learn more about your folks' needs. Here you can see both the already fulfilled needs and still demanded ones. Needs are divided into three categories. Food, prosperity, and enlightenment. So, if you take a look at the needs that these Lone Landers have, they, to be able to upgrade, need to have food fulfilled at least three of the squares, and then the fourth square that is left is a wild card. It could be food, prosperity, or enlightenment. It doesn't matter. Build a chicken farm and produce eggs. Okay. So in food tab, we can select chicken farm. And we could build a chicken farm right here. The disadvantage of building right here is that it would fill up space where the shrine is, the praying place. So you want to have your chicken farm kind of as far away from your food market as possible while also being inside the sphere of influence. So that the area around your food market is reserved for uh, prosperity, enlightenment stuff, and also houses. And then you have a distribution network feeding the food market. So as you can see, if I put the eggs here, it supplies the food market because it's highlighted and shiny. Here is too far. So I'll put it like, uh, yeah, that'll work. The chicken farm is now producing eggs, but as indicated by the icon, it's not sending them anywhere. To transport the eggs, hold left mouse button over the chicken farm and point to the food market like this. Drag and drop. You can also click on it and click the send button and then just click on where you want to send it. And then as a result, you'll see a line drawn between the eggs to the food market so that the eggs are supplying the food market. Let's increase the food variety for the folks with flour made by uh, made from barley. So now if we take a look at the lowlanders, we have a uh, value of two for eggs, value of two for the praying place, and now we're gonna do uh, the flour. So this is a production chain. You have to grow barley and then grind the barley at a mill. So the best thing to do is to put the mill as close to your food market, as it, or as far from the food market as it can be, like that, and then this is another important game mechanic. Depending on the region that you plant your barley, it will produce different resources. So right now we are in what is considered the lowlands or the greenland. So as you can see, it will produce six barley and two hay. But as we go up the mountain into the middlelands, it would produce four and three. And the very top, and of course this is a small enough mountain that it doesn't have a top, it would produce mostly hay and very little barley. 
So depending on where you plant things, you'll get different yields. And the other thing that this game does is that um, a lot of the fields will tile horizontally, but not vertically. So what I mean by that is if I put two fields like this, the bottom one has road access, the top one doesn't. But if I move the top one like this, this has road access now. As you can see, just visually, it's one contiguous field where if I moved it back up here, this is not one to contiguous field. So when you're planning out your fields, uh, plan for fields and also things like uh, yak pastures to tile horizontally so that they don't have to have as much um, road access because roads can become expensive. So then we can drag the fields to supply the grinding place. And as you can see, the further west field here, because it's all connected, technically is adjacent to the mill. So it's very, very useful to have um, sort of like sort of far flung fields that don't have a lot of road access that are still adjacent to their uh, place of work. And then we drag the mill to the food market. So now the mill, and here you can see that the mill has not full efficiency. So I could do one more field for it if I wanted to. So let's do uh, a fourth field. I'll put it right there. Done. So now if you take a look, three of the fields have a connection point like this, and one of the fields have a connection point like that. Now, if you're wondering why does that matter, for a lot of the buildings that you build later on, which is the distribution network buildings, uh, the closer things are to one another, the fewer workers it has to employ. So if you have a very inefficient distribution network, you have to employ a lot of people to move a lot of things, and that becomes very expensive. And that's a very important game mechanic that is sort of hidden initially, unless you know where to find it. Where, let's say, the farms were here, and then the mill was over here, it would take, you know, maybe 10 or 15 people to physically move the goods to do its destination, which dramatically increases the cost, uh, the running costs. So, the food market also will track the resource and consumption. So as you can see here, I am producing 12 units of flour, but I'm only really consuming 1.6. So I could also, if I'd like, go ahead and disable three of these four fields. And now I'm producing roughly, uh, I'm, I'm producing the minimum amount that I can and I'm still meeting demand, but it cuts down the upkeep costs as you can see, because this has an upkeep of four gold and turning it off, it doesn't. Plus, it ties up your um, workers. So you can disable and enable things on demand if you'd like. You can also move anything that you want for free, as you can see. Very easy to do. With three needs fulfilled, citizens are happy enough to upgrade their housing. You can do that by clicking a button above the house. So here are the eight houses that I built. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And as you can see, this last house does not have its grain needs met. So I'm gonna re-enable one of these fields and do the eighth house because the demand exceeded the production. Splendid. Looks like the Lonelanders are happy here. They will be a backbone of the settlement's economy. Yeah, but our sins won't be satisfied so easily. They are used to a certain standard, you know. But if we want to progress, we'll need them for their manufacturing skills. I'm sure we can somehow make them comfortable too. Look, 
This seems a perfect place for an artisan district, if you ask me. Well, we can try, I guess. Connect two green regions via a bridge. So this is the bridge tool. And at this point, I'm going to move the egg farm so that it's not running in the way of the bridge. And now I've connected the two regions together. And if you don't like your bridge, you can always reconstruct it when you're not in the tutorial. But I kind of like a weird diagonal bridge. So artisans, after lowlanders, are another social caste. They're helpful with running more advanced buildings. Build an artisan's district in the newly reached region. So have 40 artisans living within range of a food market. So again, we have to do another food market. And I'm going to plop that kind of right in the middle. I'm going to run a road to it. Like that. And then if we go to residential, here are the artisan homes. So each artisan home houses four. So I'm going to want 10 houses. Done. Fill the upgrade progress bar halfway. So let's take a look. They want a praying place just like the Lowlanders did. They also want grain and eggs, but eggs won't count for uh, two. It only counts for one. So their demand for eggs is lower than that of the Lowlanders. So there's the eggs. And green. Maybe I should switch the two. Actually, I'll do it like this. go. Oh, that's too far. Perfect. So now their needs are halfway met. Mountains are rich with natural resources. We can extract them using mines. Build a copper mine and connect it to the road system. So here you can either click on the deposit and go build mine or you can go to the resources here and build a mine uh, that way. I think the resources tab is locked for me here, so it wants me to do it this method. And then I can connect it to the existing road system. I'm going to put it slightly out of the way there. Done. Besides human workforce, some buildings also require yaks to operate. Build a yak pasture to increase the town's yak population. So here in residential, yaks count as residential. And I'm going to put the yaks by the farm. It's also important to note that uh, depending on the region that you put a yak pasture, it produces a different amount of yaks. So the lower on a mountain you put them, the more yaks you get and this is uh copper at the mountainside gold uh, doesn't have a green hue to it with copper extraction up and running we can use it to make utensils in the coppersmith workshop utensils are highly desired goods and goods are distributed to nearby houses from commodity suppliers so the commodity supplier here it's very much like a food market but it supplies commodities like um copper utensils or fabrics or um, perfumes, stuff like that. 
And I'll put the commodity supplier right next to the food market. And then in the production chain, the copper mine feeds the coppersmith. Now here's another important note, and the tutorial will get into this, which is that the copper mine produces four copper. Each coppersmith uses one copper to produce um, five copper utensils. So a one-to-one -one ratio is not efficient, is uh, my, my point here. And as soon as the coppersmith is built, as you can see, I'm now missing the axe again. So I'll build a double wide yak pasture and have the copper mine feed the utensils and then the utensils feed the commodity supplier. And it's saying it isn't in range. Oh yeah, that would be true because it uh, I don't have a contiguous road here. So I'm going to move this house over there. there. Now it will be in range. It seems that there aren't enough utensils for everyone. However, Coppersmith only uses one unit of copper, which means a single mine can supply multiple workshops. So, in order to distribute it, we can use a carrier post. A carrier post will take one resource and split it up multiple ways, but it has to be within range of the post. So if we put a carrier post here, And then a second coppersmith. We can then stop the copper mine by clicking this X from sending the materials directly to one coppersmith and instead send it to the carrier post. And then you can see there's a little icon over the carrier post of what it's carrying and then distribute the from the carrier post out to the two coppersmiths and then the coppersmith down to the commodity supplier. So now, the way to follow this supply chain, you got yaks running this copper mine wheel up here, bringing the copper down. As you can see, the yaks are literally running a gear wheel here. There's four of them, like a little carousel. And then that supplies the carrier post, and the carrier post supplies the two coppersmiths. And the carrier post is what, depending on the distance, there is between um, where it's built and where it's bringing things to can change the amount of workforce it requires. So out here it requires a work service of four. And here, it, um, if it was a cart post, it would uh, change more dramatically. So I'll show you that once we get a cart post up. But there we go. We have artisans and they are happy. And she has an idea. Let's expand higher. The climate in the middle zones of the mountain are just perfect for bees in producing honey. Higher mountain areas can be accessed using shafts. I'm going to build a shaft right there and have it go up. And shafts um, require a yak force. So a yak will be at the top of the shaft because it's sort of like a, a mechanized one. And now it wants me to have two operational beekeepers in the middle zone. So I can go to honey production. And if you mouse over it, you can, you can see this is another one of the resources. Uh, built at the bottom or at the top would be three, but in the middle would be five. So I get more honey for this middle zone. It's the Goldilocks zone for honey. So now they're both operational. But your brilliant plan seems to have a flaw. Flaw, it's a perfect place for bees. You act like you got stung by one. Open your eyes. How do we transport all this honey down? Relax. With the right attitude and an open mind, we can overcome any obstacle. How exactly will an open mind help us transport anything? Oh, just you wait. Let's get my fellow monks here. They'll come up with a solution. So now it wants me to build an academy. You can increase the research level of your town to gain access to more advanced buildings. This is done by building scholarship facilities such as an academy. 
However, it will grant research only when staffed. So we also need monk dormitories. So the research level is up here. And what we're going to do is we're going to build an academy. And I'm going to plop it, uh, let's say, right there. Let's connect it to the roads. And for now, I'm going to dis disable it because we don't have 38 monks to live at the academy and work. So in order to have an operational academy, we need to build about, let's say, 10 monk dorms. And this is where it's useful to mention that monks tend to like to live behind monastery walls. So when you're building monk dormitories, you should consider being able to build walls all around the facilities. On top of that, uh, monks, one of their demands is that they have scholarship nearby, which means that they need to live near an academy that is operational or there's uh, an advanced academy called a monastery. But either way, they need to live adjacent to one of these to fulfill their needs. So as you see here, in order to upgrade, I need to satisfy three enlightenment needs here. Two are offered by scholarship and one by a praying place. So I won't be able to upgrade the monks unless I give them scholarship from an academy. So let's get the monk dorms in there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Add some roads. And just like all the other casts, they also want food, obviously. So this is another one where, depending on where you put your food, you may or may not be able to supply everybody, so you need to strategize accordingly. And I don't even have enough money to place this. So what I'm gonna do is unpause the game and let time run quickly so that I can fulfill my treasury back up so that I can afford to continue construction. All right, so there is one house in a dead zone here. So it's not going to be necessarily symmetrical. Uh, and it's very difficult to build nice symmetry in this game, just uh, nature of the way the game works. Okay, all houses are now supplied by this food market. Perfect. Then we want to have a chicken farm, supply chickens, or eggs rather, to the food market. And the issue here is we don't have enough lowlanders to work in this chicken farm. So let's get some more lowlanders. Done. And these lowlanders are now consuming more eggs than what are supplied, so I need to add eggs here as well. Done. All right. So eggs are supplied. They also want honey as well. So one of the things I could do is to move these honey over here so that they can supply the food market. like that and if it's not in range we can just cut down the range like that so now this food market is oversupplied with honey so what i'm going to do is i'm going to move one of these back here and disable it for now because we don't need it running i'd rather have the money all right taking a look at their needs i have now met honey needs and egg needs we haven't offered them utensils and we haven't offered them scholarship Scholarships now enabled. So I have the academy up and running. It is staffed by 38 of the 40 monks that we have. 
And here you can see my research level is going up. At research level one, you gain access to the cart post. It works like a carrier post, but isn't restricted by range. Therefore, it's perfect for long distance transportation. Use it to send honey down to your artisans and finally upgrade their houses. So I need to have 10 artisan houses at level two. So the way this works is that you build a cart post adjacent to where you want to collect resources. I can then send the honey to the cart post and then the cart post to the food market down below. And the cart post, this is what I was saying before, it will have a variable workforce depending on the distance they have to travel. So because I'm in the tutorial, this is a perfect opportunity to demonstrate that. Let's purposefully make the run longer. And now it has a workforce of seven, not six. It was six before. So putting the cart post as close to the shaft as possible limits the distance it has to travel, which limits the amount of workforce that has to work there. And now all of these artisan houses are ready to go to level two. And at level two, we double the amount of dwellers. Done. Nicely done. We've done some decent groundwork here. We're ready to continue with our quest and travel to the first real mountain, high enough for a summit temple. Not so fast. We still need a logistics point down here. And more importantly, a way to secure our financial situation. Oh, come on. Do we really need to deal with such trivial matters? We've got better thing to pursue. Trivial? This whole endeavor is insanely complex logistical operation, which could end in disaster in a blink of an eye. And a little aside, that is very true. Everything about this game is like so very careful that anything goes out of whack and you go bankrupt really quickly. We have to make sure the treasury checks out or that's the end of us. So start getting donations from citizens. So you don't collect taxes, exactly. You correct, collect donations. Um, so that people, and I think this is kind of like begging rounds in Buddhism for monks. Uh, you set up these donation spots where your citizens can donate money. The donation spots themselves cost money to run. So try to build them efficiently so that they cover as much territory as possible. There we go. I have enough donations. And as you can see, it is a huge boon to our treasury. We were not making a lot of money until I started collecting donations. And it will also show you what donations I am not collecting, which is 80 from the monks. Yeah, involuntary donations, exactly. You got it. So now I'm collecting 500 donations, which includes the monks. This will be a good spot for a training post. It'll be easy to send resources further from here. Huh? What's that noise? You were wondering where the water came from, chat? comes from snowpack. All right, forget about it. We're all going to die. Relax, no one got hurt. Actually, this avalanche wasn't even that huge. I bet we can still have a trading post in this region. You want to stop all this snow with the sheer power of the your mind? Go ahead, I'll stay here and watch. Don't be stupid. We just need a few foresters to provide, provide tree cover. That should do the trick. So this was a game mechanic that I didn't really understand for a bit, so I will explain it as well as I am able. The way to block trees. You have a bunch of different options here. You can build foresters to block avalanches. Or I said trees, I meant avalanches. You can build foresters to block avalanches. You can build um, Mr. Plow to dig buildings out once they are covered in snow. 
you can build an avalanche barrier, but it doesn't um, block stronger avalanches, just weak ones. And then you can also, if you have the tech level for it, build an avalanche inducer, which decreases how strong the avalanches can be. Now, in the top right corner, that one snowflake means that it's weak avalanches on this mountain. Two snowflakes is medium, and three snowflakes is strong. When you build a forester, you can see downstream, there is this sort of white snowflake zone. That white snowflake zone is a zone that is protected by avalanches. And at one snowflake, it would be weak avalanches. Uh, I just ran out of workforce, though. So I got to go back over here and build more lowlanders. There we go. It's back over here. The three foresters, and, and these foresters do produce wood. They're very cheap to upkeep. However, uh, they just require a workforce. Um, they are now protecting this area from snow. So if you build, and, and if you mouse over the snow cap, as you can see, the avalanche power is weak. So if we, in building the foresters here, we can then build a trading post in the protected area. And the avalanches won't affect the trading post because it is in the protected area from avalanches. And uh, the game wants EX. All right, let's get some more EX. Okay, a full op operational trading post is all done. Yes, Dino, thank you for the resub, and Turtle and Webster too. And Requiem, thank you for all the gifted subs as well. Here it comes. And as you can see, the trees managed to stop the avalanche. I told you from the very beginning, this was nothing to worry about. Now we're finally ready to move on. Let's make our way to the first real mountain. Can't wait. Thank you for tuning in to Laysara Summit Kingdom, which originally streamed live on Twitch May 3rd and May 4th. If you have any feedback or questions for me, let me know in the comments below. If you would like to catch a live stream of mine, Rodamont.com has my stream schedule and countdown timers to upcoming streams, as well as a link to Twitch. If you would like to join my Discord, a link can be found in the description of this video as well. Thank you so very much for watching, and a special thank you to my Patreon patrons, Twitch subscribers, and viewers like you that support the channel and made it all the way to the credits. Thank you so very much. Hope to catch a next episode or an upcoming stream. Farewell, my fellow Lasarans. <laughs>